Okay, um, I see a couple of familiar faces in the audience, and um, I also would like to know how many people uh, 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 here are, are at a Write the Docs meetup for the first time. Anybody? Cool, new people, yay. It's also great to see familiar faces and maybe people who've attended uh, Write the Docs that I haven't been at. Um, uh, how many of you are actually technical writers? Just about everybody, cool. Any, any developers? A, a bit of a minority. Um, okay, well, it's, it's good to know that. Um, so I'm really speaking to people like me, tech writers. Um, so um, my, I decided to do something a little different, which I always do when I give a presentation. It's never the same thing. But today, I'm just going to say I'm here to confuse you with my presentation. Um, and the reason I want to do that is I just I want to blow everybody away and get people thinking in different ways about documentation. Um, and an, another thing that I'm doing uh, is that instead of the ridiculous claim, excuse me, that some people have, I've got to get this button working properly, uh, that in their presentation they're going to tell you how to do everything in just five or ten minutes and you're going to have all the information you need. Well, that can be true on the one hand, but the truth is that anything that is really worthwhile, you just can't get it without a whole lot of work. All right? It's, writing is hard work. Sometimes when I've worked with developers and I've tried to get them to help me with certain things, they will spend a day focusing on writing and they'll say, that was hard. Okay, so I consider that to be a real compliment. Um, <clears throat> so, um, the reason that I'm writing about, or that I, that I write for developers, is that I jumped right into technical writing doing SDK documentation after being a grant writer. Um, and I wasn't supposed to be able to do this. Several people had failed before me, and for some reason I got along with a gnarly developer who had been doing, developing a whole big system for years, and nobody had documented anything, and I got along with him. So I was able to write about his work. And in the process, I began rediscovering the importance of story yet again. Before I came into tech writing for developers, I was a grant writer. Um, and I had, I, had, I had really worked with the idea that as a grant writer, you have to tell an effective story. You have to find the right story. So finding the right story is actually a really important thing. Um, a little more about who I am personally. Um, I am the daughter of a PhD physicist inventor and concert pianist, and I inherited equally from, from both my father and my mother. And the reason I mention that as a technical writer is that that gives me an advantage. I basically dance on both sides of the brain equally. Um, some people really have a clear talent in one direction or the other, but as a technical writer, having that balance actually um, is really good, and I love what I do. Um, I wanted to mention here my first picture book was Man and His Symbols, so the reason I talk about esoteric things is that that's what I grew up with. I grew up with a, a whole library of books about Carl Jung, and I was reading them at an early age. I learned to read. My older sister taught me to read, and I can't remember not being able to read. Um, I was passionate about, passionate about writing without knowing it, and I realized over time that was the reason that I always fought with my English teachers, and I usually won. Um, I also love irony, um, and I just have to uh, mention that I am the proud mother of a university professor. Okay. Um, professionally, I have a master's in urban studies, which is um, very, uh, very, um, very cross-functional. Um, <clears throat> and I can skip over some of, some of that uh, anyway. But with my background, 
I learned um, how to characterize complex systems, um, <clears throat> which is an important thing. Um, and as a grant writer, one of the things that I used to do was write a, 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 an executive summary first and, and edit it all along the way um, until I was ready to submit a grant proposal. Um, so I didn't realize it, but as a, grant, as a grant writer, I was developing advanced writing skills just to be able to illustrate complex concepts for people. I had to um, work with metaphor a lot, and it's surprising how much we actually use metaphor in our everyday language without realizing it. Um, <clears throat> when I jumped into technical writing, uh, with my background, with all that Jungian stuff, I, I started thinking about technical writing in a larger context. And um, the megalomaniac in me likes to think about technical, writing, technical communication as being one of the most important aspects of developing our cultures. We became fully human. I think if you look, if you look at, at the background about, uh, 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 about the de development of civilization, civilization, I think, depends on effective technical communication. So we all kind of, as writers, as technical writers, we tend to have low self-esteem. But I actually think that we're far more important than some people want to realize. So that's why I have this slide in there, long before breadcrumbs, there were stone flakes. And the stone flakes that were dropped along trails that people traveled as they were migrating to various parts of the world, I see as a form of technical communication. So, this, uh, this little obsidian thing is actually something I found in a mountain in Northern California, on top of a mountain in Northern California. I looked down and there was this black thing there and for some reason it caught my eye and I picked it up in my hand and there were like a dozen different ways I could turn it around in my hand and hold it comfortably. It was sized for a woman. If I give it to a man, the same, th the same thing doesn't happen. It probably was dropped because that little sharp point at the end was chipped down. But I realized that I had picked up a multi-purpose tool that had been used and loved and had been shaped exactly to fit somebody. And you could, you could hold it in lots of different ways. So I'm mentioning this because of the context of technical communication. It's important for us to understand this. Um, <clears throat> so I know I've given you a whole long confusing background to what's really important to me. And what I really want to talk about is the art of, of story craft, of storytelling. Um, <clears throat> I'm using Casablanca uh, as an example um, for a couple of reasons. For, for, for one reason is that movies are part of what we use to communicate to each other about our culture across the world, about our cultures. Um, and the, the art of, of movie making uses story craft. Um, <clears throat> Casablanca, as, as it says here, it was a formula movie that was made during the Second World War in the movie mill. Um, and nobody thought it was going to be the kind of success that it was. And because of its, its success, Casablanca eventually became a model for agile and scrum development. 
So if you look back at this, it was created by a seasoned team in just six weeks. Shooting began before the script was finished. Does that sound like a startup? Um, and the ideas, uh, uh, some of the ideas that are used in, in Scrum on user stories come from the fact that, that Storycraft has emerged as something that's important to understand over and over and over again. So, <clears throat> Hollywood has to use Storycraft because they need to make money. But they didn't realize it at first. They only came, uh, came up with the idea of using Storycraft, analyzing Storycraft, and working with Storycraft over time because they have to make money. So the, hero's, the idea of the hero's journey in Hollywood emerged over time. And at one point, there's a guy, Vogler, um, who wrote a memo talking about the hero's journey and Joseph Campbell's book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And over time, people began to understand that there's something that is kind of hardwired in our brains where humans respond to an arc that is outlined by Joseph Campbell in The Hero's Journey. So I can't go over all of the ideas that are presented in Joseph Campbell's book um, in this short amount of time. Um, but I can summarize some of the things uh, that, that he mentioned. It, basically, um, you can find a bunch of different books that have, have used this idea and repurposed it in different ways for different audiences. But in essence, there's a, a call to adventure, a journey into the unknown to overcome impossible odds and victory and a triumphant return. Um, <clears throat> let me go forward a little bit. So <clears throat> we respond to this idea of the story arc. And that is always how we learn. Okay, No matter whether, whether we have information that is presented to us um, <clears throat> within a story arc or not within a story arc, there is something in us that, that begins to assemble information using that paradigm. So, if you have a whole huge set of complex information that you want to present to an audience and have them assimilate it in some kind of way that makes sense to them, you have to start to find a story arc. So it could be, it, 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 there's no predetermined way of finding the right story arc if nobody has done it for a given set of information. I've come into startup companies and there's been a mishmash of information and if I start to find the story arc, people start to understand the technology much more easily. But in order to explain this to other people, they have to begin to assimilate the idea 
of the story arc itself. And they start wanting to say, oh, you must be talking about marketing, because marketing people always tell stories. I, I, I say, no. What I'm talking about is if you have a huge amount of information and you start to find a story arc within it for your audience, they will begin to respond favorably. And I can't give people a step-by-step -step understanding of exactly how to come about that. That is why I go into a whole lot of things about Hollywood and stories, because everybody knows what a movie is. So think about a movie that draws you into a whole new world and helps you understand that world within two hours. Now, now sometimes it's an hour and a half. That's a lot of complex information. You know, you go to, you, you go, go to a science fiction movie and you've, you've, you've gone into outer space and you've understood some of the important things about a spacecraft. How's that done? You're given a story. A whole bunch of complex technical information starts to come in because you have that storyline and you're absorbed emotionally in something. And the, you know, the reason I'm talking about this is that it actually works. Okay. When you have a developer audience and you're trying to help them get the information that they need, then you don't have to give them drama the way that a, a screenwriter needs to give people drama to help them get engaged. Your developer is already in the middle of their own drama. They're trying to get something done, and they've turned to the documentation because they don't know something. For them, it's pitch black, and they're likely to be eaten by a gru. What's a gru? A gru must be something gruesome. So you want to give them knowledge about something that they don't yet know. You're not trying to tell them how to code in Java if they're Java coders. They already know how to code in Java. Or, or you know, you're not trying to, 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 to help them understand how to create a REST request. They already know how to create a REST request. You need to give them how to get your authentic, you know, how to get into your system. How do you authenticate in your system? Um, <clears throat> So <clears throat> I'm not going to read off each of my bullet points here. Um, I brought in this picture of how to, uh, from how to, how to Train Your Dragon, um, because the movie itself actually is kind of a cool way of, of illustrating how somebody decided to give people some technological information in a the movie. There's a lot of real, realistic stuff about flight in that movie. And it, you just learn seamlessly some things about, about flight. Um, so, <clears throat> In learning how to write screenplays um, myself, I, came in, um, I, I took some classes from Scott Myers, and I was really fascinated with his um, mention of five archetypes that you can find in almost every movie. Um, so sometimes I like to think about what's going on in, as people go through my documentation, if I give them a tutorial, who's doing what? Is the book, is the, the guide that I'm creating a mentor? You know, what is drawing the person along? These five, five archetypes, is if, instead of looking at just personas as marketing people try to 
to give you a persona to work with. You can pull yourself back a little bit um, and think about who the protagonist is in as a developer goes through the journey of learning about a technology that's probably the developer. What's the nemesis? It could be the technology itself. It could be your documentation. Um, I hope not. Um, your documentation, I hope, it becomes the mentor. Um, and what's the trickster? What comes up? What, what trips people up? Not having a, a, a parameter that they need. Um, not understanding how to use the parameter, where they go, what, what, what the parameters are supposed to do, how the parameter, uh, you know, gets sucked up by a system and used in a specific way. Um, <clears throat> so, I just thought this was cute. Um, So I wanted, because I'm talking a lot about a lot of very, very confusing stuff and kind of thinking you guys are all going to get confused listening to me, and I'm trying to respond to expressions on your faces, but I wanted to put in something um, that I came across today in my work. Okay, so I came across this as a description, um, basically of a, of, of a, uh, a microservice. Um, and I thought, well, I, I might as well just use something from my work today to, to show you what needs to be corrected. Does anybody see, see why I put this here with that heading on it? I mean, if I read it out loud, a data model of, of uh, this is supposed to be a description of something, a data model of CSP config service, a CSP microservice to provide API to push get device config. RPC callers are required to fill in all mandatory nodes and don't need to provide others if default values are okay. <laughs> all right. So actually somebody who's um, in the middle of doing something with this, I look at this and I say, a really good developer is going to understand something from this. They know that somehow something has to be filled in for mandatory notes. All right? And my job often is to take something like this and figure the darn thing out myself. All right? And the way I do it, believe it or not, is by figuring out the story. Who is doing what with what? And how are they going to get from here to accomplishing what they need to do? So it's story craft on a sentence by sentence basis and story craft in the, in the larger sense as well. You have something like this, which I'm making an analogy to a scene within a movie or even a piece of a scene within a movie. Is it making sense to people somewhat? Okay, cool. I didn't completely confuse you. So devices themselves can be characters. Um, and in working with StoryCraft, it's good to, to review levels of abstraction in, in, um, in what you're doing. You have, you have levels of, of, of abstraction in what you're writing. We use levels of abstraction in our speech, sometimes without realizing it. And there's all, there are also levels of abstraction with respect to software development. So I pulled something off the internet. Um, from uh, a PC magazine. The higher the level, the less detail. The lower the level, the more detail. And people are talking about deep learning with multiple levels of abstraction. And there's all, all kinds of stuff with learning theory that you can actually read and benefit from as writers, kind of internalize it and use it. So I wanted, I'm getting close to the, to the end here. I wanted to rush through uh, a few things here with, with symbols. 
And the reason I have these here, these are universal symbols that, that, uh, that can have many different types of meanings. And it's kind of fun to go to, to get out of the, the um, step by step um, type of writing that's necessary for tutorials and think on a broader level for a little while and see where that can take us. These, these symbols have many different meanings. I don't have time to go through them all because I'm coming up to the end as I thought I would. But you've got yin and yang can, can be seen as, as a sine wave and then positive and negative, which is all of computing. Um, <clears throat> you need to be thinking about what various people are going to be coming to your documentation for. And just as some movies can be available to wide audiences, um, like Avatar, um, our documentation sometimes can serve the needs of many different types of audiences at the same time. So um, a beginner might need a set of rules that the master will skip over in order to find the specific parameter that they're looking for in order to accomplish something because they already pretty much know what this software is all about. And that's why it's, it's, it's good to try to format things in consistent ways. You can do, develop your own way of formatting things for your own documentation. And it's going to please your developer audience as long as you're consistent throughout your documentation with how you're doing things because people, because basically developers are often very good at pattern recognition. You establish a pattern, you use it throughout consistently, and they're going to get through your stuff and they're going to be really happy because they'll be, they'll be finding what they need. Um, and if you're providing the, 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 the beginner level stuff, that some of the rules, an advanced person will look at how you've written the rules. And again, if you're consistent, those rules will tell them kind of how, what people were thinking about when they developed the system. How was, how was the software architect thinking? How were some of the senior developers thinking? What sort of decisions were they likely to make along the way? Um, and all of those things actually make a story hold together. Just as when you're in a movie, if you get, if something's inconsistent, it jars you out of the story of the movie. If our own documentation has inconsistency in it, it jars people out and they lose trust. So I'm, I'm going a little bit over, um, but I'm just about done. So I could make my slides available. I knew I wouldn't be able to cover everything that was in my slides. Um, and we write love stories for nerds. Thank you. Okay, if you already know more than one and a half programming languages, you must leave the room now. Because it's going to, no, I'm sorry. Um, it's, it's about to get really just terrible for people who actually know what they're doing. Uh, but for the rest of us, this might be helpful. Um, okay, so a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a technical writer. Um, my background coming into technical writer, I have a, one of those liberal arts majors um, who probably couldn't pass a, pass a math class. Um, if you, uh, at this point in my life, I hope I could, but. Um, and I sort of like weaseled my way into web development, um, I don't know, eight or nine years ago when like, I know how to set up a Facebook page was like a skill that you could like market to people. Um, and that sort of like let me weasel my way into project management, which let me weasel my way into telling outsourced Indian developers what to do, um, which was a terrible idea. But um, I sort of leveraged that into, yeah, I totally know enough about technology to write about it. Um, and sort of along the way, I like sort of pretended to know PHP, and I sort of pretended to know JavaScript, and I didn't really. And um, over the last year or so, 
I've discovered that if you lower your expectations about what you're going to accomplish, you can learn a programming language and get a lot done, um, both sort of like personally and professionally. Um, like, you just have to decide you're going to be bad at it. That's, that's like the punchline of this whole talk. So if you're not cool with that message, again, leave now, because that's literally the last slide. Um, I, bl I, it, I blog at hackwrite.com. I'm a fan of puns. Um, my Twitter is Adam Michael Wood, and this talk you can find at adammichaelwood.com slash talks slash dangerous.html. Um, now, what did I have to say? Oh, so the purpose of my talk is not to impart any actual developer skills. Um, even as mediocre as the skills I think you should have are, I can't teach them in 20 minutes. So the purpose of my talk is to like slightly inspire you with a few examples of cool things you can do while being bad at coding, and then sort of nudge you in the direction of these are some things you should learn, and here's kind of how to learn them. And this is all based on my own personal experience, so your mileage may vary. This could be totally not helpful for you. But, um, I think that was a mistake. Ah, no, that was right. Okay. So, enough to be dangerous. That's sort of like, this is my new thing. Like, ah, how much code do I need to learn? Not that much. Not that much. You don't have to become a developer. And, and this is a big realization for me because as someone who had been around developers, I was a project manager, I talked to developers all day long, I worked with developers, and you were all technical writers. You spend time with developers. And you see those little ads that pop up on Facebook that say, you should go to coding boot camp. And you're like, that's not going to help. Because you know you've been around developers, and you know that they learned to code like when they were 13. And then they like learned all this stuff, and they know like 27 JavaScript frameworks. And, like, and maybe I'm projecting on everybody else, but I always felt like, well, I'm, I'm never going to be that. right? Like I'm never going to have enough time in my life to learn all the things that it takes. And every time I learn something, it's like, oh, yeah, I can code. And it's like, security is an issue, or like high availability, or like some insane thing that like you were never going to learn in a coding boot camp, or even like in two years of a CS degree or something. Like you're just never going to learn this stuff. Um, and so the point is you don't have to be a developer. You don't have to know about how to like deploy Docker on Kubernetes. You don't have to know that stuff. You just don't. But um, if you have like mediocre skills, you can have like a pretty serious payoff. So what are the skills? Uh, I think there's two overlapping sets of skills. One is subject matter skills, and the other is uh, sort of tech writing skills. You already know this, right? Like you have to know about the thing you're writing about, and then you have to know how to write. That's obvious. Uh, but what do I mean? So um, if you're a, a, you document SDKs, you have to know what an SDK is, right? You have to like kind of know enough, right? You have to know how a RESTful architecture works. You have to know these things. So there's this set of dev skills that has to do with the thing you're writing about. And that's going to vary from topic to topic, from job to job. And then there's tech writing skills, which for the, a lot of us um, is like, you know, I can write English sentences. Um, I can replace semicolons with periods on a regular basis. Um, things like that, right? Like good writing skills, and maybe I know mind touch, or maybe I know how to write a confluence page that nobody will read, or something like that. Um, but so I, I want to separate out all of the things that you might learn that are dev skills, and not just coding, but sort of dev skills into these two categories. And I think the most interesting are these. And so what am I talking about? Uh, so here's an example, uh, which is automating some work that I had to do. Um, I used to be a freelance technical writer, and my only client as a freelance technical writer was is this sort of like one notch above 
bottom feeding content mill called Who is Hosting This? Have you, is anybody familiar with this website, whoishostingthis.com? They, um, they're, they're cooler than they seem. Um, you can enter a domain name and then they'll tell you who is hosting that domain name. And uh, they make all their money on um, hosting affiliate marketing, right? So like if you buy a Bluehost account through, uh, from being on this page. So I have written millions of words of content for these people. <laughs> I was writing 10,000 uh, 10, words a week um, at my peak. And you can't write 10,000 words a week unless you've figured out ways to be efficient with the way you're writing. Um, so um, one of the things that I did uh, is they don't, their content management system is like some crappy thing that was pieced together over many years a long time ago. And so if you want like it, all the sort of interlinks that you might want, you just have to like put them in yourself when you're writing content. Um, and this is like, this is like really minor. This is not a big deal. I'm not showing this to you because I think it's cool. But um, two years ago, when I didn't know how to do anything, I wrote a bash script that would go through a page that I had written in Markdown and replace and like fill in the links to all of the pa to pages. And you know, this took me maybe 20 minutes to compile all the things like anytime I mention hosting resources, it should do that, or anytime I mention dedicated IP, it should link to that dedicated IP page or whatever. And then like uh, slowly but surely, in a lot of Stack Overflow and Googling, I wrote 10 lines of code that saved like boatloads of time, like so much time. Um, and, and this stupid little thing, which doesn't, it's not important in like life, made me realize that if we sort of, if I lower my bar and say, I'm not going to be a developer, I'm not going to build apps, right? I'm not going to like deploy something to the app store. Um, but that there's this whole like layer of coding that we can do as professionals that, that will just help, that will speed things up. Um, and that was sort of like that crummy little program uh, was like a gateway drug to um, like realizing there's just a lot, there's a lot that we can do. So I started automating more work. Um, oh, that's the wrong one. Um, so one of the other things that I had to do uh, for um, who is hosting this are these, were these listicles. So who is hosting this is uh, their SEO strategy is to be like the last website in the world with a resource on technology nobody cares about anymore. Um, or, or like some people care about, right? But like nobody's going to write a new Fortran tutorial. We don't, the world does not need any more Fortran tutorials. Um, I, but <laughs> who is hosting this has one. And one on COBOL and one on uh, PL1 and just like all this stuff. So I was writing a lot of listicles. And these listicles took, they all took the exact same format. There's about 100 words of like, mm, I'm going to say definitely not paraphrase from Wikipedia introduction to the topic. And then links to all the places that you might need to go if you were going to learn Fortran or like libraries, uh, you know, or like compilers for Fortran or like how to do Fortran in Python or whatever. So like all the links that you might need if you were, that, like we're in one place. This is what I was doing. And they had to be in this particular format. And this was a job that took like, ooh, lots of tabs open in your browser and trying to decide which one was better and then copying the link into your editor and all that stuff. It took hours to do one of these things and they didn't pay that well. So I wrote a script that does this. Um, so what is it doing right now? It's combining the word Fortran with a bunch of other K 
keywords like tutorial or resource or whatever. And behind the scenes, it's going and fetching links from Google with all of that stuff. And in a minute, it will start showing them to me. And then what do I do? Then I just tell it uh, Fortran resources and compilers. This looks like it's a reference page. It looks like a pretty good one. Um, the possible title is Fortran. I don't want to truncate that. I want to change that to Fortran resources. Is eight out of nine out of yes out of eight out of nine? Do I want to capitalize the title? No. I want a description. Is a good page. Normally, I would write like a more des uh, descriptive little thing. This is the bullet point. That little yellow thing is the uh, what the output is going to look like in my list. Uh, and so this does a couple things. One, it makes all that faster. Two, it keeps me on task because like it's just the next thing. All I have to do is like look at it and, and figure it out. Um, and <laughs> I can put an ad on Craigslist <laughs> to have somebody else do this and use my script. And now I'm paying somebody $10 for an article that I get paid $80 for because I wrote this script. Um, don't tell the who's hosting people that I've done it. It's, it's not necessary for them to know. Uh, and it, so I'm on two of 77. I'm not going to sit here and, and, and do all of that. But um, if I, uh, I'm, I'll just do a couple more real quick. Uh, this Fortran applications, I don't know. Let's say that's uh, additional learning materials. Let's say it's six out of nine. Um, truncate, I'm going to truncate at the space hyphen space. Um, I don't need to capitalize it and is a better page, right? And I would, you know, write 10 words of description. I'd look at it real quick and it would keep going. Um, Wikipedia links, so now I have like a list of blacklists, so Wikipedia. Um, if I didn't like something, I can say zero do not use. Um, the quality is zero. Um, that's weird. I feel like it should have told me to blacklist it. I don't remember. Um, anyway, so, and then if I interrupt it, if it finishes or if I interrupt it at any point, it actually spits out uh, the markdown and I copy and paste that into my editor and go. If I had been just a tiny bit more ambitious, I would have had it dump straight out into the markdown file and I just never bothered to do that. This is my very first Python script. Um, I didn't know any Python at all when I started writing this script, and now it's 600 lines of total bullshit. It's just garbage. Um, it's the worst code you'll ever see. Uh, is that even true? Six, no, it's 200 lines of terrible write code. Um, oh, it, and I have another one that does the same thing with Amazon. We also did like books, you know, and so I, it, it like connected to Amazon. It would show me the book page and. And, and it would just flash through them real fast. And I would say, yes, yes, no, yes, no, yes. And all of a sudden, a job that took me hours was like, fast. And you too can do this sort of thing. Um, and that's sort of the point is you, you don't have to write, I, maybe you don't have to write listicles. Um, but whatever it is that you do in your life that's boring and terrible, just like that much code, that much code makes a huge difference. Um, so my next example uh, was being able to publish. This is a little bit later in my career. Now I'm starting to like, and by later in my career, I mean four months ago, which was sort of six months into this journey of being a terrible coder. Um, I got a job at a startup and um, is, uh, um, here, I'll just show you. Um, so Bot Central is a chatbot uh, platform. They, you can use it as a customer. You use it to build a chatbot that connects to Facebook. Uh, and then you can, somebody, one of their, your customers can then talk to you on Facebook and order pizza from you or something. Um, so this, does everybody recognize this theme, by the way? Everybody should, I hope, recognize what that looks like. That's the right to docs theme. Um, and I published this, so I got there and there were no docs. There was nothing. 
They had been working, uh, they really didn't have any customers yet, so it didn't really matter. They had been working for some period of time. They, I had an interview, they, I got a call from a recruiter, uh, which is, I'll mention that in a little bit later about the recruiter calls. Like, does everybody else get these ridiculous recruiter calls? Like, people claiming to be in Texas and they're really from India and they yell at you to read your email? Yes. Cool, okay. I was really excited the first time I got one of those because I thought I was, oh, shit, the recruiters want to talk to me personally. Um, so anyway, um, but I then discovered they just called everybody. Um, but I, so, the, my, where was I going with this? I got there, they called me, I got the call from the recruiter like a Monday, I had an interview with them on Friday, a like, phone interview, and I joked that if they needed me to come in on Monday, they should definitely call, like on Saturday. And I got a call Friday night, they need me to come in Monday. Um, and I got there, they had no documentation whatsoever, and by Tuesday, I published. I mean, I hadn't published all of these pages, but I had taken the one crummy doc that they had written and sort of edited it, and I got it launched. Um, now, some of you are like, yeah, okay, whatever, but um, if, if you have like next to no coding skills, that's, that's a big deal. But it, with like mm, that much, you can figure out how to launch a Sphinx site. Uh, you can just sort of, what did I, what techno? So, uh, yes, so this was Sphinx. Uh, Sphinx, I highly recommend for those of you who have not ever used it or have been weary to use it. Sphinx is a static site generator written in Python, written specifically for the Python documentation originally. Um, and it is uh, what powers the read the docs website. Um, it's awesome, it's so cool. But, um, because I have like this much coding skill and I can comfortable at a command line, you can like launch a Sphinx site. You can pip install Sphinx, you can set up a thing and you can push it to GitHub pages and you can be published like the same day that you're writing, like the same minute and that really impresses other people. And that's really the point, not to impress y'all but to point out that being able to do that really impresses other people. And they, it makes you look like some kind of hero. Like you didn't have to get a hosting account or ask the other developer, the, you didn't have to ask DevOps to like set you up with a thing and install WordPress or whatever nightmare other thing you're using. Like you can just use Sphinx. Actually, I have to say, uh, that's a lie. I used MakeDocs, is MKDocs, MakeDocs, some people. So the, my, the first iteration of that site was MKDocs. Um, and then um, uh, about a week of MK Docs, I realized that I really needed to be using Sphinx instead. Um, and so I spent a couple days converting all the stuff from Markdown to, to uh, restructured text, which I, should, I used a script to do. Uh, and I didn't even mention that. But it does, it just, it impresses people. And then they write you good reviews for your next job and they endorse you on LinkedIn for stuff. And that's helpful. Um, so my second, my example, what's this? Example three. Um, example three starts to get away from the writing skills you need as a writer, the writing skills, to like the domain knowledge. Um, and I hope this is helpful for people. Are people like, is this like super basic? Are y'all like, totally I know this stuff already? Cool, okay. I, I really, so my biggest fear in doing this presentation is that I'd be talking to a bunch of people who already know how to do this stuff. Um, I, I have no idea, like I'm still new to this so I don't really have a sense of what's cool or, or not. Um, so, uh, what, what did I want to say about this? Oh, okay, so, um, this chatbot thing that I was working, this company made a chatbot, or they made a chatbot platform. And the way the chatbot platform works is um, you set up content, you set up messages that the chatbot can respond with. And then there's like reasons that a message could be triggered. So like if you say, if you go to the Facebook page and say open the pod bay dollars and, and the chatbot can 
process that message and come back and say, oh, I'm sorry, I can't do that, or whatever. Um, but it wasn't as simple as that. Of course, it never is. If it was that simple, people would write their own chatbots. Um, but there was all sorts of things that you could do uh, in a message. So a message gets triggered by some incoming pattern, and then um, it could respond right away, or it could trigger a different message, or it could run some, you could, there was like a little panel where you could write JavaScript inside the message, and it would churn around and do stuff. Um, it could, I don't remember, I, but I don't have to remember because I wrote it down. Uh, message flow. It was, this was like really complicated. This was ridiculous, as you can see. I wish, I actually, what I wanted to use, oh, I can't remember now, there's some cool JavaScript library that lets you do like flowcharts and markdown, which would be like right up my alley, but I, I didn't have time to figure out how to use it when I was trying to get this done real fast, so this was like a, there's some plug into Google Docs that lets you do drag and drop. It's, it, it's a basic, it's like super basic. But my point is, um, what happens in life when you send a message to this chatbot. So there's some user input, right? And does it match a pattern or does it not? If it doesn't match a pattern, does it match a, a natural language processing intent model? If it doesn't do that, then what does it do? Um, and so forth. And then what does it do? Then it does all this other stuff, and then it does all this other stuff, and then it does all this other stuff. How did I find all this stuff out that it does all this? Did I ask the lead developer? Well, I did, and he drew me a picture that looked nothing like that. <laughs> looked nothing like, well, okay, I mean, like, it had boxes and arrows, but it was, like, four things. The person who had built this only knew about, like, he could only remember, like, that it did four or five things. And most of you have done something similar to this. You, like, open the app, and you, like, play with it, and you play with it, and you send calls to it, and you open your API thing, and you send calls to it. So that's what I had to do. Um, but I also can write like just enough JavaScript that I could, because there was JavaScript panels, I could like find the edges of where this thing would break. I could um, write, um, it, so part of the thing that was interesting is that the JavaScript was sandboxed, because there was like a special JavaScript runtime inside of this Java app. And so there were certain things that you couldn't do, but what you could and couldn't do wasn't documented anywhere. And so we started trying to think like a, develop, like a, like a bot developer, like what would I want to do? And then you start thinking about like a, somebody trying to break the system, what, are you, what, what would they want to do? Um, and because I can write like that much JavaScript, I could do all that stuff without bothering the other developers. And um, because I can read like just enough Java, and I mean like I've never written Java in my life, um, but I can read sort of just enough Java that I could go and read the code and figure out what the hell all this was doing. And this was complicated. I mean like I, I, I'm just so proud of this flowchart. It was so cool. Um, and. I also want to say about this, I think a lot of us who aren't really developers, but because we're technical writers and because we're around developers, we have to start thinking like developers, which is like conditional logic and flow and like, like control flow. And you think you understand how to do control flow until you actually sit down to write a program and you're like, but I said if this and then that's not happening. Um, so like I highly recommend the practice of learning a, a programming language, besides all this other stuff, because that sort of like forcing you to like follow a chain of conditional logic, uh, which is all a flowchart is, is extremely helpful. Uh, and no matter how good you think you are at following a chain of conditional logic, uh, until you've written a script that has to do it, it's sort of like, um, do we have any musicians in the room? Musician. Oh, excellent. You think you know how the song goes in your head, 
But if you haven't sang it out loud or played it on a piano or something, you don't really know how it goes, right? Like if you've ever made up a song, you're like, I'm singing to my head. Oh, I'm making it up, it's so good. And then you like sing it out loud and you realize like, I don't know what three of those notes actually are. But in your head, they just went fine. Well, when you write conditional logic in prose, it's easy to miss. When you have to put it in a flow chart, it's harder to miss. And when it has to run without any errors, um, it's impossible to miss. Uh, and it, so that'll teach, that it, like it really, it makes a big difference. I'm saying this from my personal experience. It made a big difference in my life. Um, OK, example four, uh, testing S3. I recently had to write a tutorial about integrating Datadog. Uh, Datadog is a, um, an aggregated monitoring tool. So your server errors and your code errors and your activity and your throughput and all the stuff that you might want to know about some software application. Um, uh, Datadog can monitor that from everywhere. They can monitor on Amazon or on your hosting, whatever. They can do it anywhere. And then it all comes back and rolls up to like one dashboard. So they integrate with everybody. So I had to write a tutorial on how to integrate Datadog with S3. S3 is the Amazon's simple storage service. It's, it's, it's just a bucket of stuff. It's just your files. That's all it is. So how am I going to write this tutorial? Well, I could read Amazon, uh, Amazon Web Services documentation. Anybody ever tried to read Amazon Web Services document? It's a nightmare, isn't it? It's just terrible. It's awful. Um, so there's nothing there that's really going to help you. Datadog themselves, the reason I was writing this tutorial is because Datadog didn't have a tutorial on doing it. So it's not like I could just like, you know, paraphrase theirs. I had to like really figure out how to do it. So what did I do? Um, well, I, you know, I read the docs as best I could. Um, but what I really needed to do was generate activity that I could then look at and report on. So how am I going to generate realistic activity? Um, I did a couple things. I auto-generated a bunch of content in Python. Um, generate post, Python. Um, I wrote this goofy little script. I, so I created a Jekyll site. Jekyll, you all know Jekyll? Jekyll's cool. I created a Jekyll site, and then I used this little piece of code um, to create uh, like a thousand, a hundred, a thousand posts. I made a thousand posts in Jekyll. And then I had like a thousand pictures that I auto-generated in Python also. Uh, I don't have a script for that because I actually just did it at the command line. Um, and then I wrote some JavaScript that did this. This is a picture, um, not a block of CSS. Um, it's like really basic stuff. It's not that complicated. It makes a request to the server and gets the next picture. And if we wait here long enough, the URL will change and I'll get the next page. And that'll sit there and do that forever. And so I created this and then I posted it to Facebook and told all of my friends, please help open this up in a browser and just leave it on overnight. Um, and I had one friend who opened up 50 browsers and ran it 50 times. Oh, some of the pictures aren't there, so it generated 404 error. <laughs> so I was requesting pictures that don't exist. Um, and I generated, uh, so I just like all of a sudden had like 10,000 requests an hour to S3. And so all of a sudden now I can actually have report because some of them are 404ing. And, some of them are real, and I can measure throughput, and I can measure uh, error rates, and, and all that stuff. None of the stuff I was writing about really required knowing how to code, right? Like looking at graphs and, and all that stuff. Like none of that really required coding skills. So as a technical writer, it would be easy to look at that task and say, I can do that. But being able to generate realistic, um, ge realistic activity was something that maybe there's some other way, but I couldn't think of how to do it without at least some amount of coding skills. And I also want to add to that that thinking of this solution, like coming up with that idea, is something I wouldn't have thought of a year ago. Even thinking of this solution as a way to generate activity is only something that I was able to do because I now have 
a year worth of terrible coding under my belt. <coughs> um, so that's what I had to do. Um, this is for an interview, by the way, which brings me to my next point, um, which is basically um, those annoying recruiting calls that you get, I get better ones since I added Python to the top of my resume. It's incredible. It's just unbelievable. Um, and I just, I, it's amazing to me. And like, one of the things that I had to get over for myself was thinking like, I can't put Python on my resume or I can't put JavaScript on my resume because I, I could never write a Python application. Nobody should pay me to write code. I want to say that over and over again. Um, I'll, I hope I'll have to retract that in a few years. Um, but right now, nobody should pay me to write any code. So I felt really weird about putting that on my resume. So some of you might already sort of be at this level and sort of hesitant, and I want to like urge you, the minute that you feel like you could do one of the things that I've showed you, put Python on your resume. It will make a big difference in your professional life. Um, it, it, the, the types of phone calls that I get, the types of conversations that I have with recruiters and hiring managers. I gig, by the way. I, don't, I haven't had a full-time job in forever. Um, and I like gigging because I like learning new things and stuff like that. Um, I just, it's just completely changed uh, the conversation for me. Which brings me to sort of my final point. Um, which is that, uh, this, and who knows what duck typing is in Python? You know? You know. Anybody else? Yes? Uh, why don't you tell us what, what is duck typing? Okay. Um, so duck typing, so it's common in some languages, if you want to know what something is, some object, you ask it what its type is. And you say, I'm, I'm, only gonna, I'm only gonna use this if it's the right type. Um, and so you get stuff like this a lot. You get type and then thing and then it, whether it is or isn't something. But in some languages, Python and I think Ruby also, um, and a few other languages, there's this idea of duck typing. And duck typing means if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's a duck. So it doesn't matter if the value you're testing for is really an integer or really a list or whatever, as long as it responds correctly to the thing you're trying to do with it. Um, and so this is a terribly convoluted metaphor for you don't have to be a developer. This idea that a developer is something, it's a type of person, um, is, it's true. Like there are people who are developers. That person is a developer. But for those of us who are sort of on the periphery of developers, people, uh, those of us who are in technology but like aren't being paid to write code. Um, it doesn't matter that you're not really a developer if you can respond like a developer in certain situ situations. Um, and I found that this first one, using the same tools as developer, makes a huge difference. Makes a huge difference. So in organizations that I've been in where as a technical writer, you spend all your day in a wiki or in a content management system or in Confluence, you have a very different standing with the other developers, with the, with the developers, developers, uh, than you do if you are working in a text editor or at the command line. It's just different. If, if everybody in the room has Adam open, Adam is a text editor, it's the one I use. Um, if everybody in the room has a screen that looks like that, and you have a screen that looks like confluence, you're treated differently. People think of you differently. Um, if every time you need like something simple like I need a hundred posts generated automatically, or I need a thousand pictures of various sizes, and you have to go ask somebody to do that, you're treated differently. Um, but if you can if, you, if your workstation looks like this, or if you can go to a command line and git clone, and git commit, and git push, and do that stuff yourself without having to ask somebody, you're just treated differently. 
um, it, it just it makes a huge difference to um, things. So that that is the end of the why you should do it, um, which I hope was inspiring. And now I'm going to go quickly through uh, what I what I think is the most helpful few dev skills and sort of like where you might want to go to learn them. Um, there's no shortage of ways online to learn how to do this stuff, um, but some of them are better than others. Um, I am a huge proponent of people using Unix-like systems. Technical writers who work on Windows are shooting themselves in the foot. Because um, developers, like the kind of developers that are like cool and startup-y and engineering-like aren't doing that. Um, if you're going to go work at Intel, uh, which I just finished at, and everybody's on a Windows machine, that's fine. But uh, Mac or Linux, learn to use a command line, the terminal. That's right, this thing. That thing. I've got a better one up somewhere. Oh, it doesn't, doesn't have anything on it. Um, <coughs> learn to use a terminal. Learn to, like, set your own preferences on it, you know, like, play with it make the font the way you like it and stuff like that. Um, learn Bash. Bash is the language of the terminal. Um, that will let you, like, if you are starting to use the terminal and you realize you're writing the same four commands over and over again, you can write a little Bash script and it'll do it for you. Um, and learn to use Git. If you learn those th three and a half things, um, developers will treat you like, not exactly an equal, but like that you're on the same team. Um, so where do you learn that? Software carpentry is my, is, is where I would suggest. Um, they have two sort of sister organizations called Library Carpentry and Data Carpentry. Software carpentry is not for technical writers specifically. Um, all the carpentry, uh, the software carpentry uh, orgs are nonprofit organizations that are devoted to teaching these skills, like specifically those skills, to academic researchers. Um, so, um, I think there's like a nice Venn diagram overlap between the type of people who become technical writers and the type of people who spend a life looking at mollusks and deciding like how many hearts they have. I have no idea. I don't know anything about mollusks. But I think there's like a definite overlap, right, between those groups of people. Um, so, but software, that's who software carpentry is, is like really focused on is, is academics, biologists, you know, geneticists, whatever, like re academic researchers, musicologists, people like that. Um, and it's these skills. They teach them these skills and Python. Um, and then library carpentry is the exact same thing, devoted to librarians, which I bet there's a number of people in this room who are thinking, gosh, I wish I was a librarian. Well, you can sort of live out that fantasy by learning how to use uh, all this stuff in the context of library science. And then there's data carpentry, which is for data scientists. Um, all three organizations teach the same core set of skills. They just have sort of different domains that they're working in. Pick the one that's the closest to your heart. Um, they have all their material online, and then they also have like um, stuff all over the place. I know um, uh, UC Berkeley, hosts uh, software carpentry events, and they're sort of all over the place. Um, if you're also looking to jumpstart your career, um, you could also take a few classes and then become an instructor at software carpentry. And um, it's a volunteer thing, but uh, like they're, if you volunteer and become a software carpentry instructor, like it's a big deal. You meet a lot of people and do cool things. Um, and then Python. Uh, again, that should have been a star, like asterisk carpentry. Um, and I don't know why it's a square. Um, and then automate the boring stuff. I think almost everybody who's tried to learn Python has run across this. Um, this is a very helpful book because it is coding Python for non-developers. So it's not about how to build applications. It's not going to teach you how to do a really crummy content management system. It's like how to move text around or like how to um, munge data, like the sorts of things that we have to do, it, this is what this is for. Um, 
and I would strongly avoid, if you start trying to learn Python, you'll run across this book called Learn Python the Hard Way. Um, it looks like this. And avoid it like the plague. Um, you should avoid it like the plague. This is sort of a side tangent, but I just want to bring it up. You should avoid it like the plague because Zed Shaw's a maniac who hates happiness. Um, <laughs> And, and he wrote this screed against Python 3. Uh, Python 3 has been Python for like a decade, and he's still like making a thing about how we should all use Python 2. He's an idiot. Um, right after he wrote this, he also said, and I'm probably not gonna use Python anymore anyway. So like, who cares? Um, I bring that up because it's like literally the most popular book on learning Python. Um, don't read it. Automate the boring stuff is sort of the replacement. Um, and then, uh, so in addition to like general, like use the terminal and learn how to use Git, learn Py a little bit of Python, and then learn these three tools. If you learn these three tools, um, you'll actually have stuff to do with these skills. Sphinx and Jekyll are both um, um, static site generators. Jekyll, you probably know, is the static site generator associated with GitHub. Um, I don't recommend it, um, but because it's native to GitHub, it's so easy for so many things. So like there's a lot of instances where it's really helpful. Also, a lot of startups use Jekyll for their documentation. They shouldn't. They should use Sphinx. And if you get a job at a startup and they started using Jekyll, you should move them to Sphinx. And if you know both technologies, you'll know why they should do that. Um, um, Sphinx is written in, in Python. Jekyll is written in Ruby. Uh, yes? I want to put a plug-in for ASCII Doc, ASCII Doctor. ASCII Doctor is also an excellent tool, yeah. I'm, I, um, I like Sphinx better, but ASCII Doc, so um, the thing that makes ASCII Doc and uh, Restructured Text, which is the Markdown language associated with Sphinx, better than Markdown, is that it's, it supports structured, uh, structured authoring. So those of you who have been technical writers for a long time know about like um, DITA and all this like XML stuff and um, what's that terrible frame maker. Um, that n nobody really wants to use that stuff. And developers don't want to use that stuff. And that's why they've all started using Jekyll and Markdown because it's fast and snappy and fun. But you lose a lot. You lose all of this sort of like tight integration between your documents. Sphinx um, solves that problem for you. An ASCII doctor also does. Um, it, it, it allows you to do structured authoring and like, like deep linking and all this stuff. Um, and Sphinx, and I don't know enough about ASCII doctor, you should ask her afterwards. But Sphinx also like runs all sorts of tests on your documentation. ASCII doctor does too. So um, when you build, it tells you that I linked to this page and that page then doesn't exist. That shows up, it just tells you. Um, or you link to this page and you link to this function reference, but that function doesn't exist in your library. It just tells you. Um, so Sphinx is really cool, I love it. You should use it, you should learn it. Pandoc is uh, written in Haskell, uh, which doesn't matter. Um, Pandoc is what I use to make this nice presentation. Pandoc is a, docu is a document converter, basically. It's a command line tool, so you have to be comfortable with the terminal. And it allows you to change Markdown to HTML, or HTML to ASCII doctor, or ASCII doctor to PowerPoint. This is actually JavaScript, whatever. Um, uh, it, but it allows you to like easily switch between formats. So if you've ever had the situation where you're saying, I have all these HTML documents and I need to turn them into a PDF, and your only solution to that is to copy and paste them into Word, then your life is terrible. But if you know Pandoc and sort of understand how to use it, you can do that real fast. Makes your life easier, makes you happier. Um, and the guy who wrote it is at UC Berkeley. I've been to his office, um, which would be a cooler story if I went in and met him, but I didn't. Um, I want to address a question that nobody has asked, which is why Python? Of all the languages that you could learn, why Python? I heard somebody before mentioning Perl, like Perl might be, I thought it was you. Um, Python is the new Perl, so if anybody tells you that Perl is the language that like people do stuff with, it's Python now. 
Um, so why Python? Why should you learn Python of all the languages you should learn? Because it's simple, because it's easy, it's like the most straightforward language I've ever seen. Um, except Ruby, I think, is probably a little more straightforward. But this is the real reason. Python is the lingua franca for writing code as a non-developer. Um, if you want to write code, but you're not writing an application, there's a good, strong chance that you're writing Python. Uh, places like Google, places like um, Facebook. Um, I'm trying to think of some other examples. Anybody? Anybody? Places use Python as sort of their glue language, as their scripting language, as their task automation language. So all the things that you might want to do that aren't building an application are in Python, and there's libraries to support it, and there's just all this good stuff. It's easy. It's plug and play. It just does things for you. And, and this is the big reason, there's a very strong docs culture. Sphinx was written for the Python documentation. Read the docs and write the docs are powered by Python. Um, what's his face? The guy who, what is his name? Our fearless leader of Write the Docs in Portland? Eric. Eric. He's a Python developer. This stuff matters. Um, I want to talk briefly about domain area skills. So you should learn Python. You should learn you know, that other stuff. And then if you're like, ah, but what else should I learn? Learn Java. If you want health insurance, learn Java. Um, because it's everywhere. Like every large company writes like tons of stuff in Java. And if you can read Java, you can write API docs. Um, and JavaScript because it's freaking everywhere. It's just like so much JavaScript in the world. It's ridiculous. So I, those are the other two languages I would learn. I would focus on Python because if you know one language and then you show up somewhere and they're like, we write Go here, you can like, OK, I know how to do that. You like Go and you get the language reference and you spend a day and you can do it. Um, uh, Java and Python are like two ends of the spectrum on how things are done. So I would recommend Java as a good second language if you're like getting to the point where you kind of know Python decently well. Um, and JavaScript is one of those things like you just stack overflow in Google and you can figure stuff out. It's, you're not like writing web apps, so you don't really need to know that much. Um, and this is my big point. I, um, I don't usually talk this loud or this ridiculously, but this was my point for this entire thing is that being shameless about coding skills is the thing that has made all the difference in my life. And I encourage everybody, and I already this, I previewed this, right, to lean into your imposter syndrome and enjoy being bad at things. If you can like get over this, like I hate being bad at, like so many of us, I think, who came into tech writing are sort of like, introverted perfectionists, right, who like, oh, really want to do things right. You can't learn to code if you're going to read the whole book before you write anything. That just isn't how it works. Uh, but if you can like just get comfortable with, I'm going to write some really, really, really ugly code, <laughs> and then be really excited about how it does one stupid little thing, you can do like amazing stuff. Um, and not only will you do amazing stuff, you'll be more productive, and then you'll get even more annoying calls from recruiters who really, really want you to come work for Facebook and Google and places like that. Um, so that's my talk. Thank you.